Good evening, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to this live stream broadcast. Uh, we are live on Facebook as well as YouTube, so you can take your pick on whichever platform you prefer. We are about to go live with Ivan Bunn's history session. This is episode number 15, believe it or not. And tonight's session will be entitled Lowest Off Drifters in the Adriatic. And this, this entails work that was carried out in, in the World Wars that um, that involved lowest off drifters and their captains, I believe. And this is this is a story particularly personal to Ivan, which I'm, no doubt you'll get details of. Firstly, I'm just going to mention that the Rogue Shanty Chorus, uh, we live stream on a Tuesday night. So every Monday night so far, we've been broadcasting with lowest off historian Ivan Bunn. And that always starts at 7.30 as long as the technology allows us. From now on, we will be broadcasting the history sessions on a fortnightly basis. So tonight is episode 15. Episode 16 will be on the 14th of September, and that's already been titled, Why Build a Harbour at Lowestoft? We'll chat to Ivan briefly about that later when he comes on. First off, we've had a couple of comments. Firstly, from Linda Boyce, she says, evening all. Good evening, Linda. Thank you very much for tuning in. And another one of our regulars, Susan Corkmash. Evening, everyone, she says. Good evening, Susan. Thank you, both of you. And I will stress, it is a real, real boon for us when people type their comments into the comment section. It really lets us know that there's people out there enjoying tonight's session. We know that there are, of course, but it's really helpful to us and to our funders, which is People's Health Trust, to know exactly what the comments are. And if there if there are some questions, feel free to put them in. We don't get an awful lot of time to pose questions to Ivan because he always drums us up a wonderful and good length of, um, of what would we call it, a picture show and, uh, and talk. So the, the questions uh, we get the chance to pose to him are quite minimal, but if you have anything, put them in and I will decide which ones are the best and which one's the most appropriate, and which ones could be the most interesting to ask Ivan about. Ivan will be with us very shortly. I'm just going to mention a little bit more about the Rogue Shanty Chorus. Now, every Tuesday evening through lockdown, Stephen and I, who head up the Rogue Shanty Chorus, have been live streaming to keep everybody within the chorus connected and to encourage that feeling of community that we so enjoyed before lockdown when we were able to get together and have a good old sing song of sea shanties every Tuesday, every other Tuesday at the Seagull Theatre in Pakefield. Obviously, with lockdown, that was totally unavailable to us. So, Stephen and I carried on live streaming every week to just, as I say, make sure that people still felt connected to the chorus. That then grew into us being able to include these history sessions with Ivan Bunn. So far, they've been weekly. As I say, they'll be moving into fortnightly sessions. And a couple of people that I know have enjoyed lots of these history sessions, as well as the Tuesday night shanty sessions, they would be Barry and Jackie Draper, or as I like to call them, Jackie and Barry Draper. They put up evening all. Good evening, Drapers. Hope you're both well. Good to see you joining in. And uh, another regular is Hazel Rumble. Evening all, really enjoying Ivan's talks. Well, thank you very much, Hazel. So are we. If you'd care to join us on a Tuesday, we'd be delighted to welcome you to the Sea Shanty Sessions every Tuesday. That's at 7.30 p.m. And I'm just going to mention that our sponsors are the People's Health Trust. They very kindly sponsor us, keep us um, broadcasting and live streaming. And... This is what their logos look like. So you can see down here, People's Health Trust and Health Lottery East, and they are our current funders. And we say thank you very much to them for keeping us going, for keeping us able to connect with as many people as possible. And that, that's not only just our beloved regular rogues that come along to it almost every session at the Seagull Theatre when they're on, but also some of our new rogues that might have joined in as part of as part of our live stream sessions, or even as part of Ivan's sessions, and they've wondered what on earth we're talking about when we say the Rogue Shanty Chorus. So anybody that's joined us along the way, we consider you rogues. And in fact, anybody that's joining us tonight for the first time, whether or not that's via Facebook, or perhaps it's on our YouTube channel, either way, you're, you're all welcome. You're all one of us now. We're all rogues in one way or another. 
And another rogue, and I say that in, in the most polite way possible, is Sude. She says, hello, everyone, tonight. And this is something we were speaking to uh, um, last night to Sue and Jackie because they help us immensely with, with the background, the behind the scenes tasks that go on. And we were mentioning how important it is to us that people still feel able to chat in the comments box. And, and it might be that they, they direct the comments directly to one another. That's absolutely fine. And because it really does help to foster that, that feeling of community. Some, some people may not have been out very much at all when lockdown started. So if, if we're joining up in this way, that's perfect for us. Anyway, I've rabbited on and rabbited on. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to welcome everybody's favorite local historian, as you know, that is Mr. Ivan Bunn. And here he is. Hello, Ivan. Hello, good evening. It's my turn to wrap it on now. Yeah, you have some rabbit. I'm sorry to keep you waiting so long. But thank <laughs> no, you no, no, that's me. fine. That's fine. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, it's good to be back again. I can't believe it's 15 weeks we've done this now, but um, <laughs> it certainly kept me occupied for 15 weeks. And I hope uh, you've all found it um, interesting to a greater or lesser degree. Um, it certainly, certainly, are. Yeah, it certainly got my um, brain ticking over when perhaps it wouldn't have been doing it. Hello, mm. Sue. Um, who else have we got there? Sue. We've, we've also got Hazel Rumble. She says she's been watching on Tuesday night too and uh, great fun. But what she first said was, evening all, really enjoying Ivan's talks. And I think that's the feeling from a lot of people out there. Well, thank you, Hazel, and good evening to you. And yep, and also good evenings from Jackie and Barry Draper, from Susan Corkmash and Linda Boyce. Hi, Susan. Hi, Linda. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Draper. Yeah, excellent. Now, Ivan, um, tonight's session is entitled Lurst Off Drifters in the Adriatic. We'll come back up to that very, very soon. But um, this has um, interested me. You, you briefly spoke to me before we started about our next session which is in fact on the 14th of september uh, because we're, we're going to be moving to fortnightly sessions but the next session episode 16 is is entitled by yourself why build a harbor at lower stoft that's correct yep. <clears throat> and yeah. um and as you mentioned that that's looking or, or culminating in the harbor that was created did you say early 19th century yeah, the harbour was created, it was actually opened officially in 1830, the very, very first ever harbour um, at Lowestoft. Um, so much of what happened later in the 1840s and 50s is laid, and rightly so, um, at the feet of uh, Samuel Morton Peto, uh, the building of the harbour that we the start of the building of the harbour that we know today but mm -hmm. um he actually, uh, actually latched his wagon onto an earlier enterprise that uh, didn't really work and without giving too many secrets away mm -hmm. the people who were responsible for building the harbour at last of actually uh, were the great and the good of norwich and not last of but I'm not going to give too much away. No, 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 absolutely. And I'm not going to make you. I've tickled you enough on that on that subject. Um, and, and as I promised, tonight's session is called Lowest Off Drifters in the Adriatic. So without any further ado, are you ready to commence on that? And I will begin the slideshow. Yeah, but just before we begin this um, side, sure. uh, slideshow, the, uh, just set um, the big, big picture. Yeah, uh, and then we come down to the slightly more local, smaller picture, uh, which in again needs a little bit of explanation of why I'm doing what I'm doing tonight in this format. Um, first of all, um, throughout the United Kingdom, um, certainly I think it was about 1858, the Admiralty and the government re suddenly realised, although we had a very professional and a very large Royal Navy. Um, with professional full-time sailors that they had a great corpus of really, really um, good seamen um, around uh, all the different ports, basically the fishermen. Um, these were many of whom had been gone to sea for years. They were familiar with the waters around these isles. Uh, they knew how to handle their craft. 
And so they created, I think it was about 1858 or 68, I, I'm not too certain on the date, uh, they created um, a reserve navy, the Royal right. Naval Reserve, and they encouraged local seamen, particularly the fishermen um, around these shores, not just in England, but Scotland, whenever there was a, to join the Royal Naval Reserve. They got a, a little bit of training. Um, I think they were paid an annual bounty of a few pounds, um, uh, just as they used to do with the Territorial Army. And <laughs> they were um, continued in their trade as fishermen, etc. But they're, by joining the Royal Naval Reserve, they agreed at the time of a national crisis, particularly in time of war, they could all be um, mobilised and uh, used by the Royal Navy for military purposes. And I think somewhere in the region of 200,000 men um, joined the Royal Naval Reserve. And <clears throat> uh, how best to put this, uh, not only did they get the men, but they then had the opportunity uh, to uh, requisition the boots. So if you think about it, and we'll see how well it worked in the First World War, uh, this talk is about the First World War, um, particularly about last off drifters of the First World War, how well it worked, because um, not only could they um, call up all the reservists, they could also requisition their fishing boots if they needed them for whatever purpose. So suddenly a fishing boat, a drifter or a trawler, complete usually with its crew, most of whom were Royal Naval Reserve men, they now had an active unit as part of the Royal Navy um, with experienced seamen uh, and skippers. And so um, these fishing boats, it's a big story. Um, the story tonight is just a, a, a tiny um, fraction of that big story of how these fishing boats um, were used and why they were used. And so, as I say, this is the what happened in our, my story tonight is the story of um, the men of the Royal Naval Reserve, or some of the men of the Royal Naval Reserve, who were um, called up together with their boats. Um, and the little section I'm going to talk about tonight of the huge, big naval picture of World War one is uh, um, one that's basically forgotten um, or it's now been almost sidelined. Um, but of course, for the men who took part in this, it was um, big time. So if we could just put the first slide up, please. Certainly can. Ivan, one thing I've forgotten to mention is please click share. share. This would be the ideal moment for anybody watching to just click that share button and help Ivan's talk get out to as many people as possible. And with that, Ivan, I'm going to shut up and leave you to it. OK, and, uh, yeah, if we could go to full screen now with the presentation. All right, so here is a typical lower stoffed uh, drifter. Um, the story of which is the, the focus of um, her story and her role um, in the First World War um, is the focus of my talk tonight, um, LT441, The Boy George. Now, if you could just click the screen, uh, click once for me, Stephen, uh, that will bring up the titles. Right, here we go. Okay. Again, before we go on to the, just a little bit of background. Um, the story is hinging around this one man, okay? Now, he's not the only man that went to the Adriatic, but he's uh, um, a distant family member um, who I've researched and fortunately been able to get a lot of information about him and why they went, he went to the Adriatic with other fishing boats, uh, uh, particularly last of drifters, um, why he went 
and what happened there. And it's basically his story. But it's I like to think that riding on the back of his story and i'm sure i'm hoping i can, i've expanded this enough as we go along so you can see is the story of all the other last off drifters that were sent to the adriatic uh the man in question here here's his picture in his royal naval reserve um skipper's uniform um He's Ephraim Elijah Snowling, born in 1871, died in 1940. So this is his story, but it's really also the story of all the other skippers and their boats and crews that were sent to the Adriatic in 1915. So I'm going to start by telling his story, watching him grow up in Lowestoft leading into the events of 1914-15 and then following and his, his exploits and the exploits of other last off drifters in the Adriatic and I'll hopefully be able to paint the bigger picture as we go along so we'll start off um, if we can change the slide please so I say he's Ephraim Elijah Snowling. He was born uh, the eldest son of um, Robert Snowling, who lived at Alton. He lived in Workhouse Lane, Alton, uh, became later Union Lane. It still is Union Lane. Uh, Robert was an uh, agricultural labourer and Ephraim was his first son. As I say, he was born on the 30th of March, 1871. Um, the census in the background there is um, three days later, the 2nd of April, 1871. And there you can see him um, as a, a, a less than a week old baby at home being recorded in the census together with his mum and dad and um, his um, two sisters. And he was actually baptised, um, christened in St. Michael's Church at Alton. Um, on May the 7th, and there is his baptismal entry from the um, registers of St. Michael's Church at Alton. So he's the son of an agricultural labourer and um, growing up in Alton. Uh, there doesn't seem to be have been any history of um, fisher folk in his family whatsoever, um, his father was, wasn't born um, in Lowestoft, he was born in Norfolk and um, uh, I can't find any other link with uh, the fishing or the sea uh, in the family. So if we can change to the next slide please, we'll just quickly go through his early life. Um, it will be early. Um, here's the April 1881 census of Alton. Ephraim is right on the very bottom line. Um, he's now uh, 10 years old and he's a scholar. So he's gone to school, um, probably been educated at the old um, Alton Broad Primary School, Galston Road School or Yarmouth Road School as it was first called. Uh, that opened in 1876 uh, when he was um, five. So almost certainly that just... 10 minutes walk, less than that probably, unless he dawdled, I suppose, uh, down Galston Road to the school. And that's where he received his fairly formal education. Very, very little is known or nothing really is known about his um, life in Alton um, at this time. Um, but we know at an early age and at the age of um, 12, he actually started to go to sea. And if we just go to the next slide, we can just follow his career very briefly. So at the age of 14 in 1885, he's at Lowestoft. He's a fifth hand. He's the boy on board LT23 um, trial. That's the name of the boat. He would have been the boy who had to go down the... Um, hold and coil up the sodden ropes as they were hauled on board um, a very very thankless um, job 
um, as I say, 14 years old. Um, but the later records show that he probably started at sea um, at the age of 12. Okay, good. Briefly go on, uh, quickly go on to the next slide. We'll catch up with his story. So um, here he is um, on board the boy Jack um, down in Catawater Harbour at Plymouth. This is when the census is taken in 1891. Um, his boat is um, in port down um, at Plymouth, probably on what they call the Westwood Fishing. And um, we should see in a second or two, if I got these slides worked out right, we should see the census entry come up. This is quite important. Um, you can see he's the um, fourth man down. He's an able seaman on board of that sailing smack, that drifter. Um, the master, he's 20 years old, by the way, at this time, if you can't see the slide too well, the master is two years older than him, 22 years old, um, George Breach, um, also from Lowestoft. And George Breach and um, Ephraim uh, Snowling were obviously uh, knew each other from, uh, as we see from later evidence. Um, they knew each other, obviously, um, because they're serving on board the same boot. But at the same time, they appeared to become friends and eventually uh, became partners. So there he is. He's um, 20 years old. He's already got six years um, at sea under his belt. And that's why he's now classified as an able seaman. He would be able to do most, if not all, of the jobs involved um, on a sailing drifter and so he's an able seaman as i say only 20 years old but with six years experience um under his belt so that's in april 1891 uh, and that same year was a momentous year in his life because if we go to the next slide um on the 24th of december that year he got married in St. Michael's Church, Alton. Uh, there's his, um, excuse me, there's his um, marriage lines up on the screen there. Um, he married, um, I can't read her name from here. Oh, where are we? Uh, Mary uh, Summons, her name was. Um, uh, she was born in um, Flixton, just along the road, possibly. Um, uh, sweethearts from childhood, we don't know, but he married her there, um, as I say, um, on the 24th of December, 1891, um, when he was um, 21 years old, according to that. But according to my math, he was actually only 20 years old. Uh, but <laughs> we don't go into that. And his bride was also um, uh, 20 years old, both single, obviously. And so he's a married man and he remained uh, married to her all his life and uh, they produced um, in total um, in the next um, couple of decades 11 children and here are the names of his children um, if you could just click me for a new slide please Stephen uh, there was the photograph of the background was taken in the 1950s. That's some of his descendants. Um, here's his big um, family, um, four of whom died uh, young. There's Stanley, 1893, Mabel, 1895, Florence, 1896, Leslie, in 1900, Ernest Ephraim, 1901, Reginald Herbert, 1902, Hector, 1904. Phyllis Mary, 1907, Stella, Elizabeth, 1910, Edward George, 1911, and finally, June Snowling, December, 1914. So that's the 11 children from that um, marriage. 
So we need to now to just move on again. Um, we know 1906, um, at the age of 35, he's still at sea. He's now the mate. He's got a mate's ticket. That means that is, if necessary, he can actually take over as master or the skipper of um, a um, fishing boat. And, of course, by 1906, he's moved away from the um, sailing drifters, the smacks, and he's now on board of a steam drifter. On the 19th of August 1906, a wooden steam drifter built at Chambers um, uh, Shipyard in Lowestoft um, with the original number of uh, 122796 was launched. And um, on the 19th of February the next year, having been fitted out, <clears throat> She was registered as last uh, as LT441, the boy George, and George Breach was the owner. And the picture you saw in the background there, you can just see it there still. That's actually the boy George LT441 on her maiden voyage. Um, and we can trace the history of that boat very clearly. <clears throat> on the 19th of February 1907, Ephraim actually purchased a, qu a quarter share in this boat with George Breach. And three years later, um, Ephraim qualified for his master's ticket. That meant he had passed the Board of Trade tests, that he was now considered to be fully competent to um, take command of a drifter or a trawler, um, sail or steam. So he's now a master. And... Um, Two days later, he bought um, he bought another of the quarter shares in the boat. So he's now a half share owner with George Breach. And then in 1912, Ephraim purchased um, George Breach's uh, half share in the Boy George, and he actually became the overall owner. So from the <coughs> Excuse me, the 3rd of February, 1912, Ephraim Elijah Snowling is now the outright owner and skipper of LT441, the boy George. On the 4th of October, 1915, boy George was taken up by the Admiralty as boy George the third. And I explain why he's had his name changed in a moment. Um, as a net vessel uh, with the number uh, 1927. And Ephraim is called into service. He's a member of the RNR, as most of the men in Lowestoft are. Uh, he's called into service as a skipper um, and a Royal Naval Reservist uh, with the. Um, uh, uh, Royal RNR um, number WSA1962. So he now becomes um, a skipper, uh, Royal Naval Reserve uh, WSA1962, and he's now 43 years old. Now, a few weeks later, Boy George III, with Ephraim as skipper, was ordered, along with other Lowestoff drifters, to sail in convoy to Italy to join drifters that have gone out earlier. And if we just um, flick to the next um, slide, please. And now a little bit of background um, information. Winston Churchill, um, early in, in May 1915, um, I put the notes on there if you want to read them, um, <clears throat> decided that they could put uh, drifters and trawlers to use. Um, he'd already kicked off the Gallipoli campaign and he came up with the suggestion um, that the drifters in particular um, could be used to put a um, anti-submarine net blockade um, across the entrance to the Adriatic um, large nets that would come on to a moment that would deter 
German or uh, their allies, Austria, Hungary, sending submarines from the Adriatic down into the Mediterranean to attack the British ships there. And um, so on the eve of um, Italy's entry into the war, on the 30th of August 1915, the British Admiralty issued orders for 60 drifters to be prepared to leave the Adriatic as soon as possible. Uh, these were crewed primarily by fishermen uh, with a divisional officer for the Royal Naval Reserve for each division. They were divided into small divisions. <coughs> Apparently, the regular naval officers um, weren't particularly enamoured with the fishermen that they had suddenly got under their um, command, being... Um, um, so we, how shall we decide? Free range chickens. The fishermen didn't take very well to uh, naval discipline. And Lieutenant Cochrane, the second in command, commented that the human material was of the best. It needed only a period of polishing before it would shine with exceptional luster. Um, the men weren't, most of the um, RNA, RNR men weren't issued with uniforms as such. Um, they went out to the Adriatic in a complete mishmash of um, um, their normal um, fishermen's clothing, really. And of course, the boots didn't just come from Lowestoft. They came from Great Yarmouth. They came from Hull. They came from Grimsby. Many of them came from Scotland as well. And they came, they they appear to have gone to the Adriatic, not as a single body of 60 um, boats, <coughs> but um, in uh, sort of dribs and drabs. Um, and the first dr uh, drifters arrived in Taranto, Italy, right down um, in the heel of Italy, on the 22nd of September. Taranto was going to be their base, but it wasn't actually, um, that was going to be their depot, um, it wasn't the base that they would be operating from when it came to land the anti-submarine nets. And so this is Boy George III. He, Boy George III, because in actual fact, there were two other um, boats called Boy George um, from Scotland. And um, there was Boy George um, the first, Boy George the second by that time. So rather than have yet another Boy George, um, the Admiralty decided the Boy George from Lowestoft for the duration of the war would keep her registration number, LT441, um, with her naval number tagged onto that, but she um, should become Boy George III, Boy George III. And so that's basically the story as to why these 60 drifters uh, were sent all the way through to the Mediterranean um, to take part in um, combat um, or, well, they did enter into combat, as we shall see. So we've got Boy George III uh, with her crew on board going out. But as I said earlier, it wasn't just um, Ephraim's drifter. There were other drifters um, that went. And if we can flick on to the next slide... And of course, here's a, one of the very rare photographs. These are Scottish drifters um, heading for the Adriatic. Um, you can see they're in uh, line, of, um, roughly in line of convoy. <coughs> Apparently, the Commodore of the um, got very, very annoyed because he couldn't keep the uh, drifter men <laughs> um, sailing in nice, neat, straight lines as they should do in the Royal Navy. They all went their own way and did their own thing on the way out, uh, much to the annoyance of the regular Royal Naval officers and ratings. Uh, they showed their spirited independence as fishermen. <coughs> Obviously, um, Ephraim Snowden didn't sail the boy George. Um, I'll continue to call it the boy George because um, you know which one I'm talking about. Um, he didn't sail that single-handed, and um, these are the names of the crew that probably went with him. 
Um, I haven't been able to find the actual names of the crew who sailed out there um, in um, uh, September 1914, but these are the names of the men we now were registered as the crew in July. Um, uh, sorry, he went out in 1915, not in 1914. I beg your pardon. Uh, these are the names of the crew of the boy George in July 1915. Uh, whether these were all RNR men, whether they all accompanied um, the skipper, uh, um, Ephraim Elijah, Snowling on the journey or not, we don't know. But I would imagine that as crews tended to stick together, uh, most of these men um, sailed to the Adriatic on the boy George. Um, various ages ranging, um, ranging from 57 uh, down to 20. So it's a cross-section um, of local men. I know one or two of them weren't actually last of men. Uh, one of the men um, on the list there, um, I think it was James uh, Garrett, he, he came from Wrentham. Uh, there was a Galston man in the crew um, as well. So these are the boats heading for the Adriatic, but they didn't go alone from Lowestoft. Uh, again, I think there was two divisions went out, and I think um, e Ephraim's boy George and um, some of the boats went out a little bit after the first division moved to the Adriatic. But again, it's very difficult to get the exact movement orders um, at that time. So if we go to the next slide, let's just have a look. So here's the names of all of the vessels from last off, the drifters that made up that fleet of um, a total of 60 drifters going to the Adriatic. The ones that I've outlined in red uh, or highlighted in red, those are the ones that never came back. These are the ones that got um, sunk. Um, um, LT456, Clara and Alice, they were lost um, during the their time in the Adriatic. Uh, the Manzanita, uh, LT1113, LT215, Restore, LT1127, Boy Harold, uh, LT408, Enterprise 2, um, LT276, Girl Gracie, LT136, Michaelmas Daisy, LT1174, Young Linnet. Of these boots, it's almost um, a, a quarter of the boots that went out from Lowestoft, and this is the total number of boots that went out from Lowestoft and their names. Uh, these are the ones that were lost during their time in the Adriatic and never returned. Um, and many of them, um, they their crews perished with them. I'll come on to that. So Ephraim is not, and his boat are not alone. They're with local Last off boots, many of the crews of whom would have been mates. They probably went out for a pint together when they weren't at sea. Their families probably knew each other, and uh, but they all went out presumably um, willingly um, to um, fight for their country. Um, if we go to the next slide very quickly, just to give you some idea of the fleet, I've managed to find photographs thanks to... Um, the uh my colleagues in the port last of research society who have an immense um collection of photographs of local fishing boats these are photographs of uh, uh 20 of the boats that i've been able to actually identify from their name and number and uh, so this gives you some idea uh, you try to envision these probably um, not all traveling in one go, probably there was two divisions went. So here we have the map. So there's the UK, uh, there's the Mediterranean, 
there is um, Italy, slap bang in the middle, uh, with the Adriatic to the northeast, um, and the Straits of Otranto down at the bottom by the heel of Italy. Uh, that's where the net blockade, the anti submarine net blockade, was going to be um, placed. And we'll come on to more of that there. Now, just bear in mind that these drifters. They're all steam drifters. They're all purpose-built boats for fishing in the North Sea waters, uh, the English Channel up as far um, as Scotland, round to the Irish Sea. Um, that's what they're built for and what they're intended for. But they now had to make this long journey um, to the Mediterranean um, in divisions. And so we can follow their track. I've been able to track roughly where they went. Um, I just need a little click, please, to set the Boy George in motion. And so their first stop was Portland. That's where the star is. Their first stop was Portland. Um, that's where, now remember, they, they, they need coal um, to fire the boilers, to produce the steam, to drive the engines, to make the boat go along. Um, they didn't carry enough school, uh, coal um, to take them all the way to the Mediterranean um, in one fell swoop. So they steamed round to Portland. Here they took on more coal. Um, we're told um, by some eyewitnesses, not only were they in the coal bunkers, but they even had um, great bags of coal stacked up on their decks to make certain they'd got enough for the journey. They travelled um, southwards, um, down through the Bay of Biscay, round to Gibraltar, and there they had to stop again to take on more coal, so the records show, to make sure they could complete the last leg of the journey through the Med, um, round by Sicily, um, round by... Um, the heel of Italy to the port of Brindisi. Brindisi is the port from which they were operating their net barrage. <clears throat> and so, as far as I know, I can't. I found no other um, indication of anything different. They actually all got all the last off boots got there safely, as did all the rest of them. So the last off contingent made up. Um, approximately a third of the number of drifters from UK uh, that actually went to the Adriatic. So we can go to the next slide, please. So I circled Brindisi. Uh, Brindisi was the port they operated the barrage, um, the net barrage from. A little bit more about that in a moment. Taranto, which was the depot, um, this is where they could take ships to be repaired, to be, um, um, if they're damaged, um, that's where they would be taken. There was a, a, a depot ship there, we'll come on to in a moment. The first barrage, the first net barrage was put across, uh, was going to be put across at this point, and um, it certainly was. Um, but later, um, it was decided, um, for reasons that I'm not quite sure of, that they would actually move the boats and put the barrage across here, um, uh, across to Corfu. So this, these are the Otranto Straits. And here you see a wonderful photograph um, taken in the harbour, the port at Brindisi. And here you can see British drifters at Brindisi. Um, literally dozens and dozens and dozens of them. These ones look to be more like to be Scottish ones, although I'm, I'm not sure. The boats were all armed in the, brow, in the bow. Most of them were armed with rather pathetic three-pounder um, um, guns. One or two of them had, uh, or a number of them had a, much, a slightly heavier gun, um, a six-pounder for their defence. And from what I um, read from um, various sources, the boy George Ephraim's boat um, was actually, in fact, armed with a six-pounder. So the men would have had to have been trained 
uh, by their Royal Navy uh, counterparts uh, in the operating and firing um, of these guns and also um, how to deal um, and put out the anti-submarine nets. Um, as I said, um, round the um, heel of Italy um, on, in the port of Taranto, and if we go to the next um, slide, please. Um, um, HMS Queen was um, um, birthed there. She became the mother ship, the depot ship, and um, it was here that the ships um, would be taken out of service from time, the drifters would be taken out of service from Brindisi and sailed round to Taranto to get, uh, there's uh, Taranto Harbour there. Um, um, uh, I think that photograph was taken in 1920. They would sail round to Taranto Harbour and that's where the men could presumably have a little bit of what I think they call R&R &R these days, a little bit time ashore. Um, a little bit away from the front line um, where um, the ships could be replenished, um, any repairs carried out, possibly um, restocked with coal, etc, etc. So that's in Taranto and as I said this um, almost obsolete um, battleship HMS Queen was in actual fact the mothership. And so if we go to the next slide now, Right, anti-submarine nets. I hope you can see this illustration. It's a little bit um, fuzzy. The anti-submarine nets were very large steel meshed nets that floated like a curtain in the water. And each vessel would be responsible for one putting out one of these nets. Um, they weren't actually fixed to the vessels. They floated freely in the water and uh, there was a, a, a buoy. Um, so we got the floats along the top of the neck and then there is a buoy that you can see on the first in, floating in the water. Um, the theory was, and it turned out to be more of a th theory than a fact, that any enemy submarine, and you've got to imagine line after line of these nets going right across the, the straits, um, being um, nursed and shepherded by their drifters who had launched them. Um, the theory was that a submarine would come along, get entrapped in the nets, and as it dived um, down, um, it got to a certain depth, and the buoy um, that um, it dragged down with it was automatically released and attached by a wire um, would surface and automatically a, a phosphor, uh, phosphorus um, flare would be triggered uh, to show that the net had actually caught a submarine. And at that point, the drifters, and, and there were some trawlers there as well, uh, would go along and drop depth charges, hopefully um, destroying the submarine. Um, as far as I've been able to discover from the existing records, and that there is quite a lot been written about this, that is only positive that the, the whole time the barrage was there, from um, late 1915 through to December 1970, only two submarines were ever caught and destroyed in this way. Um, so whether... Um, Winston Churchill, uh, bless him, was very good at dreaming up some harebrained um, schemes. The Dardanelles campaign was certainly one of them. And this seems to have been a scheme that looked very, very good on paper, um, but wasn't very practical as far as I can tell. I'm not a nautical man, but it just seems as uh, the amount of resources that were thrown um, at this and the results uh, were... Um, it's negligible, really. If we go to the next slide, please. And remember, we're in a water. So here's a, a, one of the few photographs that I've ever been able to find of three um, sailors. These are probably R&R &R men, two of them in their fishing gear, and one of them looks as if he's been issued with a Royal Naval uniform, or possibly he's a Royal Naval man himself. Here you can see them throwing 
this huge net over the side of the drifter. Uh, whether this was taken in um, uh, the Adriatic, I don't know. They were putting similar um, uh, nets across um, the southern across in the English Channel, in particular, at this time. So this might well have been taken there. But as you can see, it's a bit of a hefty net. Um, this photograph obviously dates from late 1917, I should think. Uh, these are some of the earliest um, women's um, Royal Naval Service girls, the early Wrens. The Wrens women were um, recruited into the Royal Navy in 1917 for the first time. And here we see two Wrens. Um, and, uh, I was told by somebody who thought this was lower stuff, but I don't think it is looking at the background. It could well be. But here's two wrens, and you can see they're repairing um, a anti-submarine net. So this gives some idea of the size and weight of these nets that the fishermen were having to hoik overboard um, in the Adriatic in the hope of catching a submarine. As I said, they never really did... Um, um, work. Perhaps they acted as a deterrent, um, who knows. But there is evidence, as we shall see, that the Germans and their allies, um, the um, um, Austro-Hungarians, um, did take them seriously. Um, but we'll come on to that in a, mo in a moment. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is basically now what they're doing. Um, now, war is raging, particularly in Serbia, um, across the Adriatic, um, and in January 1916, the Austro-Hungarian army invaded Serbia, which is um, just across the, the water <coughs> from Italy, across the Adriatic, and the Serbian army was thoroughly defeated. And the Austro-Hungarian army invaded Serbia. They pushed the Serbian army right through Serbia, as you can see on this map, into Albania. And <coughs> basically, um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Serbian soldiers and civilians um, were driven right down onto the beaches of the Adriatic um, in Albania, a place called uh, Durazo, I think I pronounced that rightly, which I circled on this map. And there they are trapped between the Austro-Hungarian army um, who's um, to their um, uh, east and the Adriatic and the Otranto Straits to their west. And if we go to the next slide, please, I've got a few photographs of this event, and it is an important one. Um, between January 1916 to February the 21st, 1916, the Serbian army basically had their version of Dunkirk. And here you can see in the top left-hand picture, you can see Serbian soldiers trudging in defeat uh, towards the coast. And here on the bottom picture, you can see them being taken off the beaches by um, small boats to be put onto larger boats and rescued. It is there basically their Dunkirk. And many of the vessels that rescued them were in that under fire were Lowestoft drifters, one of which was the boy George, LT441, uh, skipped by um, Ephraim. He sailed um, under fire many times, apparently. Um, he sailed and he took off civilians, um, in particular civilians um, in his boat, it seems, and uh, they were ferried down the coast to the safety of Corsica. And Hun uh, tens of thousands of um, Serbian soldiers and civilians were rescued this way. And here you can see again, unfortunately, the photos aren't very good. You can see um, the bottom 
small bottom left hand picture that's uh, a, a british trawler uh, with a smaller boot going out to it and again there are other boots in the top right hand picture again who are ferrying the serbian soldiers uh, off the beaches and the lowest off um, boots and the other herring drifters um, um, were ferrying these men under fire down to Corsica and safety. And so um, perhaps for the first time, and uh, let's see, he hadn't been out there only a few weeks. Um, Ephraim Smolling, his crew, the skippers and crews of the other drifters um, in the um, or trying to states were in actual fact subject to a baptism of fire as far as um, i've been able to find no boots no british um, boots at all were lost during that ex um, um, evacuation probably because they didn't come in close enough to the shore to actually uh, <coughs> be at much risk of being hit <coughs> so we push on to the next slide. Now we're going to have to take, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, we're going to take now a, quite a quantum leap forward. Um, we were in February 1916, presumably for the ensuing um, 15 months, the um, drifters continued their net barrage, um, changing with each other. Um, and this, I hope you can see it, this kind of gives what I think in the military call the Orbat, the Order of Battle. Now, we're going forward now to the night of the 14th and 15th of May, 1917. And here the list, this is the official report from that night, um, of 52 drifters that were deployed across the Otranto states um, straits um, putting down anti-submarine nets and nurturing them and looking after them um, <clears throat> and so as you can see they're divided um, into divisions uh, the boy George um, the third um, Ephraim's uh, vessel um, together with um, three others um, there's more listed there, but if you look closely, you'll see there's some that have got brackets around them. If you can see the screen clear enough, uh, that tells us um, from the notes at the bottom that in actual fact, uh, they had been withdrawn from that divot from C Division um, to go back to Taranto uh, or Brindisi uh, for uh, repairs. So instead of having a full division, um, there was only... Uh, excuse me, there was only four vessels in C Division and the total of 52 drifters um, out of the 60 that there were are strung out across the um, Otranto Straits. So this is the night of the 14th, 15th of May, um, 1917. Now if we go to the next slide i hope this is going to work okay i've tried to put some graphics in in a moment to show you what happened now at approximately 3 a.m on the 15th of may 1917 down the adriatic came a flotilla of austrian hungarian warships the sms Novara, sms Seder, the helgoland plus two Balaton type destroyers. So that's five large warships, heavily armed warships, steamed under darkness um, from the north through the Adriatic. Uh, they attacked a couple of Italian, remember the Italians are our, our, our allies in 19, uh, in the First World War. Uh, they attacked and sunk a couple of Italian vessels further to the north. And then they came down the coast of Italy um, under the complete cover of darkness towards the drifters, the British drifters and the net barrage. And if we go to the next slide, please. So here's uh, the plan. Using the original report of what happened that night, um, 
the Battle of the Otranto Straits has become to now uh, as uh, was uh, known, and here you can see the roughly the positions of the different divisions spread out across um, the straits. And uh, other than that, this is only approximate. Uh, two of the divisions that you can see, the one to the uh, N division and A divisions, they're heading away from the barrage. They've served their role. Uh, that's, they've relieved, been relieved by other um, divisions who are now casting their nets. So the Austro-Hungarian warships came down um, on the west side of the Adriatic, completely under the cover of darkness, and they attacked, they sailed through the and past the drifters and then immediately turned round and attacked the, the British vessels. Now, I don't know if this is going to work very well or not, but if you click it for me just the once, At 3.30, they attacked the 1st Division, N Division. And then the next one. And then the next one. That's the division of the boy George coming under fire. Moving systematically, these vessels attacking the British um, drifters that cut the nets adrift um, and scattered in all directions. Uh, by 4.15 a.m. they had got across to the coast of Albania and they had hit and totally um, scattered the British um, drifters. The 14 drifters uh, were sunk and uh, those are the vessels that I've coloured in red. They're the ones that were sunk and lost. Uh, the of the Lowestoft drifters that were involved in the battle, if it was a one-sided battle, I suppose, um, <clears throat> these are the Lowestoft drifters that um, were caught up by the Austro-Hungarians. Um, two of the Lowestoft drifters were lost, the girl Gracie, LT276, and the young Linda, LT1174. Um, um, <clears throat> some of the some of the British vessels um, did actually engage the um, try to engage the um, Austro-Hungarian um, warships. That after um, um, attacking all of the um, divisions across the Straits, then headed north. Um, there was radio contact. Each of the divisions had one Royal Naval person on board um, in radio contact with um, the shore and um, HMS Devonshire and some other British warships who were based in uh, based, uh, um, Otranto and Brindisi um, headed north uh, to take on the Austro-Hungarian warships um, as they sailed back up to their home port um, to the north and there was quite a battle ensued there but that really um, had nothing the drifters were not involved in that at all they were busy trying to rescue their comrades and survivors um, take in tow some of the vessels that were damaged and badly damaged um, one um, Scottish skipper um, actually did chase after the in his drifter and his six pounder chased after the um austro-hungarian warships and actually engaged them with his puny three pounder gun and um his uh, ship was uh, sunk and he was taken prisoner and for his gallant action in actually taken on one of the warships he did um he's he was skipper watt or Watts, uh, he actually got the Victoria Cross here um, for his action. And so um, after this was all over, the British drifters uh, retired back to Brindisi to, um, and round to Taranto for repairs. And so 
Ephraim Snowling in the Boy George found, as his fellow Lowestoftians and fellow fishermen from Britain did, um, caught up in um, a real sea battle. Can we go to the next slide, please? The Commodore, the Vice Admiral in charge of the British operations there was Commodore Algernon Walker Heniage. Uh, and uh, he sent in a very, very long report of exactly what happened that night. Um, it's this report that I've been able to use to um, build up a picture of basically where the vessels were um, who got, uh, which ones got sunk, what time the attacks took place. And in his um, report, right at the bottom, he put, the conduct of many of the crews of the drifters is worthy of the highest praise, as not only did they remain in their ships, but even attacked the enemy with the three-pounder guns. And this was the bottom line of his um, report. And if we go to the next slide, please. And from the naval records and from the supplement of the London Gazette for um, August 1917, we see that Skipper Ephraim Elijah Snowlin, Royal Naval Reserve, number 1962 WSA, was actually mentioned in dispatches uh, for his conduct during this battle. And the official report from the uh, Commodore said that he displayed great coolness when under fire, handling his drifters with skill and returning to search for survivors. And so his um, solidness, a good old um, unflappable man from Alton, Lowestoft, um, in the Adriatic there, um, caught up in a battle that he probably never expected to be in, um, acted very coolly, and instead of as some of the vessels did, um, tried to get away from the attack, um, returned to the area when the battle was raging, because his division was one of the earlier ones to be attacked. The attack went on for an hour and a half. Um, his division was attacked quite early, and one of the ships in his division uh, was sunk. Um, he nevertheless stayed in the area and returned, um, presumably um, at first decided to get out of it, but then uh, returned in the middle of a battle in the dark um, to search for survivors. And for that, he got a mention in dispatches, um, along with many other um, brave men. So we go to the next slide, please. Now, when the Lords of the Admiralty received uh, their report from Commodore Heniage, uh, they sent a letter back to him. And they say in it, with reference to your submission of the 30th of May last, that's his report about the action that's got there, relative to the raid um, on the drifter line in the Adriatic of May the 15th by Austrian cruisers, I am commanded by my Lord's Commissioner of the Admiralty to inform you that they have observed with regret that while the officers and crews of a large number of HM drifters displayed great gallantry, some of the drifters were too readily abandoned and surrendered to the enemy, thus, for, uh, thus failing to uphold the traditions of the Navy by holding out and fighting to the last. I am to request that the officers and men concerned may be so informed. Yeah, thank you, Lords of the Admiralty. Uh, you're dealing, actually, not with trained um, Royal Naval um, mate levels and personnel. You're dealing with um, fishermen who find themselves in situations that they've never had any real training to cope with. It's understandable some of them decided it wasn't worth um, holding out and fighting to the last man. Um, hopefully, Commodore, Vice Admiral Commodore Heniage didn't pass this information on <laughs> to the officer and men concerned. 
uh, per perhaps, hopefully, he didn't inform them of the um, message he got back from the Admiralty, or if he did, perhaps he did it uh, with tongue in cheek. So we go to the next slide now, please. By December 31st, 1917, um, it was basically clear that um, the net barrage wasn't um, particularly successful and working. It was costing too much in um, resources, um, the lives of men, the ships and what have you. And so they started to withdraw the drifters back to Britain. Um, on the 21st of December, um, uh, seven months after the um, battle um, with the Austrian-Hungarian Navy, the boy George and the crew left Brindisi for England. And on the 25th of January, um, 1918, the boy George arrived at Devonport and is attached to a Royal Naval Depot ship, HMS Halsey and the two. And um, so it gives some idea actually how long it took them um, 25 days to sail from Brindisi um, back to England, um, to Devonport, the big naval dockyard there. Um, on March the 1st, 1918, um, she sailed, um, the boy George sailed uh, to Pool Harbour and was attached to another depot ship, HMS White Oak. Um, and on 15th of November, 1918, she sailed to HMS Wallington, which is actually a shore base um, at Immingham and um, on the North Sea coast. And uh, there she would have been, um, had her um, six pounder gun removed. And um, on the April the 1st, the next year, um, Ephraim was actually demobbed and released a few days later uh, uh, from um, his reserve role and became a fisherman again instead of a RNR skipper. And a few days later, the Admiral release, released the boy George from Royal Naval Service. That's the 1st of April, um, 1919. And presumably Ephraim was then finally able to sail his vessel back to Lowestoft to be reunited um, with his family. And so we move to the next slide. The home of um, Ephraim and um, his wife was um, the 37 Alexander Road, this house here. This is where they lived for many years. And the photograph is the only photograph um, I've got of Ephraim and his um, dear wife. This is obviously taken in his studio. He's still in his R&R. Um, best R&R uniform um, and there he is in the studio after his um, adventures along with his crew, his vessel and all the other Lowestoft drifters um, in the Adriatic at the end of the war. But it's not quite the end of the story. So if we move on, on the 17th of December 1921, the King of Serbia, Peter I, um, awarded many of the men who rescued the Serbian um, troops and um, civilians from the beaches um, at Durazu, um, way back in 1916, were awarded the gold medal for um, zealous service, as it actually says on the certificate, uh, by His Majesty the King of Serbia, um, Peter uh, I. And there is the list of some of the recipients. In total, um, if we think there was probably 50 drifters um, with crews of approximately eight um, who might possibly have been involved in that um, rescue 
of the Serbian troops, um, along with um, Ephraim Snowling and his crew. Um, so that's um, 400 men. Uh, actually, 71 of those men got the Serbian gold medal for zealous service, as it's actually called. Uh, here's a list of some of them. And you can see there's two or three more Laustoft skippers who were awarded um, the medal. And we go to the next slide, please. And there's the actual the certificate um, of um, this is Ephraim's actually uh, original certificate. There's Peter I, the King of Serbia, and there is the uh, gold medal for zealous um, service, which um, is basically um, a bravery award, uh, as I said. And this was awarded to um, Ephraim Snowling um, to go along with his um, mention in dispatches that he got during the um, the battle with the Austro-Hungarian um, Navy. Um, pushing on to the next slide, we're coming to the end of the story a little bit now. Um, so here you can see the names of the Lowestoft skippers who were actually also awarded the um, gold medal for zealous service. And... Um, I um, tracked down one other certificate. There we are. Uh, that's um, um, uh, thanks to the family of um, Mr. Saunders. Uh, this is a copy of the certificate awarded to Joseph William Saunders. But unfortunately, somebody, a clerk somewhere, got the information wrong. And on the certificate, sadly, he's... Um, named as James W. Saunders, when in fact he was Joseph William Saunders. So these are some of the Lowestoft men, or all of the Lowestoft men, who got the um, gold medal for zealous service, service for the, from the King of Serbia. So we'll push on to our next slide, please. Now this is um, this is um, Ephraim Snowling's um, Royal Naval Reserve service record from the First World War uh, that um, I got from the National Archives. Uh, the area I've um, marked with that red square I've enlarged. In actual fact, um, in the Royal Navy, whenever a vessel was um, involved in an action which involved in damage to um, uh, another, uh, an enemy vessel, um, whether they captured it, sunk it, damaged it, they were, they could be, and they had been for generations, rewarded by prize money. And obviously, um, for, I don't know quite how, Ephraim qualified, but according to his service record, as you can see there, um, he qualified for um, uh, prize money. He didn't get it until 1922 and 23. Um, didn't get it all in one lump either. He got it in three um, lumps, but it came to a total of £103.5. So by 1923, by the last payment of the 8th of August 1923, he had received £103.5 uh, from the Admiralty in prize money. Um, that, by today's standard, that has the purchase and power of uh, well over £4,000. Um, so it's um, been calculated. So perhaps... Um, he wasn't uh, completely, um, he didn't see his service in the Mediterranean and the Adriatic um, as a complete financial waste of time. Obviously, he was being paid as a skipper by the Admiralty over um, and above this um, prize money that he received. So we move to the next slide, please. Finally, he received his other medals, 
um, his 1914-15 uh, star, his 1914-18 uh, war medal and the victory medal to go along with his Serbian medal on the 14th of July 1924. Um, if that photograph was taken of him and his wife not long after he returned from uh, the um, Adriatic in 1919, that probably explains why he's not wearing any medals um, actually on his uniform at the time. So, um, and there of course is the RNR badge um, that he's got on his cap um, to the top. And again, this is not just Ephraim's story. This is the story of so many last off skippers um, at this time, not just the ones that went to the Adriatic, the men that served all over the, the Brit, um, all around the British Isles and further afield um, in their drifters and trawlers in various roles, be it mine sweeping um, or um, putting down submarine net barrages, not just in the Adriatic, but particularly um, in the English uh, Channel. So we move on to the more or less the conclusion of the story. I've entitled this All Things Must Pass, as they must. Um, Ephraim continued in till 1931 um, as skipper of the boy George, his boot. Uh, there she is on her maiden voyage. Um, uh, and in 1931, the poor old boy George LT441 has outlived its shelf life. Uh, she's broken up. The, her certificate of seaworthiness is cancelled and the registry was closed on the 10th of June 1932. And to all intents and purposes, the boy George boy George III, if you want to give him a, a, his um, wartime, her, the wartime name, um, <coughs> ceased to exist. It must have broken Ephraim's heart, I should think, that he had to do that. Um, and now, really, we know very little more about Ephraim's life. Um, he continued at sea, we know that. And if we go to the next slide, we're going to have to take a um eight year jump in time um by 1939 um him and um his wife mary ann um are now living with one of their daughters uh, phyllis utting and phyllis's husband um in this house uh, at the top of kirkley run uh when the national register was drawn up in 1939 um, copies of uh, which I've seen, we can see, um, I've arrowed it because the writing is dreadful. <coughs> uh, there is snarling Ephraim E, his date of birth is exactly right, 30th of March 9, 1871, a male in occupation fisherman, but the, um, the enumerator, the person who um, took these records would make notes about anything and the red writing beside the word fisherman is very difficult to read but with a magnifying glass and um, it actually says incapacitated so Ephraim in 1939 is not at all well man and he's now living he's given up in his house in Alexander Road he's now living with his um daughter or one of his daughters and their her husband um, at the top of Kirkley Run. We go to the next slide please as we draw this story to a conclusion. Ephraim actually died um, on the 15th of July the following year um, at the age of 69. As I said he died in his daughter's home in Kirkley Run a very, very long obituary and funeral notice uh, was in the Lowestoft Journal. You can see that on the right, probably can't read it. And the, we're told he was a well-known skipper and boot owner who went to sea for 57 years. 
Um, if that's actually a correct statement, then you take 57 from 69, his age at death means that he went started at sea at the age of 12. He served during the last four as Warrant Officer Royal Naval Reserve in his Drifter Boy George. He was stationed in the Adriatic for a long period and was awarded the Serbian Gold Medal for Zealous Service at Drazo, where he rescued women and children from the port under heavy fire. Mr. Starling was the oldest skipper sailing from this port when he retired two years ago, owing to ill health. So he finally gave up the sea um, in um, probably 1937, early 1938. And as it says in his obituary, he was one of the longest serving skippers in the town. And so we move to the next slide, please, as we just, I just wind this up. He was buried on the 18th uh, of July, 1940 in Kirkley Cemetery. And his grave is there, there and marked. Excuse me, well, we just have another drink. We're just moving to the end. Um, this should um, change. Them. I think judging by the number of people who um, were um, sent wreaths and flowers. And, there, and uh, this is actually his grave. Um, this is um, his great granddaughter, my wife, standing beside the grave of her great um, grandfather. And um, as I said, the... Uh, the presentations decided to run slow. Never mind. Um, can we just uh, click that once? Um, uh, see if that works. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And as I said, his family put on his grave, life's work well done, no resting, which I think is probably a good as epitaph as anything. His wife, in actual fact, Marianne, she um, continued. Um, um, to live for quite a long time. She didn't actually die until 1958. So my concluding slides um, is an in memoriam. Um, these are the names of the Lowestoft um, fishermen, RNR men, who actually sailed out to the Adriatic. And these are the names of the men who never came back. These are the men who died um, in the Adriatic on their net barrage um, duties. And this is an acknowledgement to them. And um, as I said, these are kind of some of Lowestoff's uh, forgotten um, heroes, for a want of a better word. And uh, that really is. Uh, more or less the end of the story. I think that's my last slide. I decided, I think, uh, uh, just to remember the names of these men. Yeah, I just need to thank uh, the information I got from that National Archive London, Port of Lowest of Research Society, Lowest of Maritime Museum, Suffolk Record Office at Lowestoft, and family, uh, family, family and friends of the Snowling family. Without the um, help and advice from these different organisations, um, I don't think I could have um, put this uh, together. Um, as I said, it's kind of a, um, a family story as well as uh, a story that I think encompasses uh, a forgotten aspect of um, lost of fishermen and drifters in World War I. Um, if we can just come back to full screen again, I've just got um, one or two other little bits and pieces here disappeared. No, I haven't. There I am. Ah, there we go. Yep. So, um, in actual fact, uh, what I've got here, just to uh, complete the story, um, I do actually have Ephraim's medals. Um, I've actually had new ribbons put on them, and there, there's the victory medal with his oak leaf to show that he got a mention in dispatches. Here's the 1914-15 um, star. Here's his 1914-18 medal, 
And here, looking slightly dilapidated, is in actual fact the Serbian Gold Award for Zealous Service. And here, if I can get it up, well, I, it still hangs proudly on the wall. Oh, is his original certificate in Serbian um, presented by the King of Serbia um, in 1921. So that's kind of what brings the whole story, there we go, you see that bit better there then, um, uh, to a conclusion. As I said, uh, risk of being repetitions, it is in many ways a, a, a family story, particularly uh, for my wife's side of the family, but um, um, it still is, I think, a microcosm of the story of all the men and the drifters that went to the Adriatic um, in the First World War. Um, if anybody's got any questions or comments, um, perhaps you'd like to ping them up. I hope um, you found it interesting and slightly different from the stuff that I normally do. Well, I certainly found it very interesting. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, really, really um, enjoyable is not the right word because uh, uh, it was so sad to see that a lot of those men didn't come back. Was it Was it six ships uh, in, in red early on that I noticed? Um, uh I think it's more than that. Really? Off the top of my head, I can't remember. We That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, you know, more than you, you'd hope. Yeah, but, it, um, but I think it's more than six because um, I'm just trying to think. I think there was... Must have been eight then. Uh, two, yeah. Something like that. Uh, off the top mm. of my head, I can't remember. Sure, but um, yeah, obviously, very, very sad, uh, very sad circumstances, and and I wonder if the widows ever received, um, you know, some sort of um, pension from. from yes, I from... think I think they did. I think war widows did get something. Um, fortunately, um, Ephraim's wife didn't have to worry about that because he came no. back. No, also sad, sad in many ways, as you, you managed to pick out that it said on that on that uh, register, um, incapacitated. It, mm. it, seems, it seems little wonder, really, that if, if he only sort of retired from such really heavy toil at the age of pretty much 67, um, mm. it's, it's almost as if the, the poor man wore himself out, you know, completely. Um, but uh, Linda Boyce uh, mentions... Uh, such brave men they must have wondered where they were going um and and that's probably true even if they were oh. told i think uh, uh, perhaps a lot of a lot of men at the time didn't have a, a great experience of of the globe outside of their fishing uh, th their fishing grounds yeah I, I i think that's a good point as well because um men who volunteered for the army um they knew that they could be sent anywhere in the world but I don't mm. think dr men in drifters um, who basically just sailed uh, around these um, sheltered waters here ever dreamt that they would be sent um, all the way to the Mediterranean and the Adriatic. Um, that must have came as a bit of a shock to them. And mm. perhaps but uh, tin uh, tinged with excitement. Absolutely, yeah. Um, certainly get the adrenaline flowing, I should think. Mm. Um uh, a comment from Hazel Rumble. Uh, thank you. Very interesting and a hard story, well told. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all of that. There, there are many, you know, many, many facets to that story, and, and some of them, um, you know, d d deeply worrying for for the men at the time. Um, but, but as I said, quite quite exciting um, and and um, yeah, just, just a real sense of of, of, yep. of adventure. I should think well, real adventure. As in all things like this as well, even right down to the present day with all modern communications might have, it must have been worse back then. For every mm. one of those men on, um, um, I think there was uh, about 34 drifters from Lowestoft with crews of eight, uh, that's about 300 plus men. For every single man on those crews, there's extended family back in Lowestoft worried for them. yeah more, more often than not a, a wife with 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 a number of children to to look after and you know we think 
we think now of the Great War being a war unlike any other, and that, and that's obviously true. But you know, at, at the time, war was war, and and I'm sure those their good wives knew there was a good chance that they might not see their oh, husbands again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now here's a here's a comment from well, and a question from a, an old friend of mine, James Wright. I went to school with James, and he's a lovely, decent yeah, hi, fellow. James. Yeah, uh, yeah, you'll you'll remember James as well. I I'm, remember. I'm sure. How could anybody forget James? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I I just uh, as a tangent, I noticed in in that in the roll call that you, that you have at the end, we had a we had a, a, a name of Wright, and we had a number of names of the knights. And of course, we had a couple of drapers, and and there, those three names are names that that come up regularly in our comments uh, from James Wright and from from Robert Knights and uh, from Jackie and Barry Draper. Um, and of course, you never know, but the, the, I should think being Lowestoft folk, there's a good chance of of relations there. Anyway, James Wright says, "Thank you, Ivan. Very interested to learn that story, helping keeping their memories alive." And yeah, I think that's exactly right. James is is that. For a lot of for a lot of people, their store their own stories are uninteresting um, because th they've been lived by them. They know they know their stories very well, obviously. So it seems unremarkable, but it's only when they're told uh, externally and 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 by somebody else that they really that they come alive at that point. And and you're right, it does help to keep those people freshen our memories and keep those memories alive. Um, James wondered, is the Serbian medal gold plated rather than pure gold? No, it's not pure gold at all. It's it's a it's a fairly cheap thing. I don't say that disparagingly. What it no. means is important, but it's not. Um, I think in actual fact it's basically brass. Yeah. Yeah. And I because, imagine that's, in, that's due to the, the resources and the materials being needed yeah. for, for the war effort at the time. Yeah, because uh, the Kingdom of Serbia, I think it was, in, round about the time this medal was issued, uh, ceased to exist. It became part of, what did it come part of? Yugoslavia, I think, eventually, didn't it? They all became together, Albania, Serbia... Yeah, um, they all came all came together into under uh, one, and uh, they abolished the monarchy. Peter the first apparently was the last king of Serbia. Uh, this was almost his uh, swan song. And as the country had actually been invaded um, by Hungary or the Austro-Hungarian army, um, as we saw back in 1916, um, after the war, there must have been very very few resources. No, yeah. left. no, the medal is brass. There's no doubt about it. Sure. Yeah, the, the resources have been plundered already by the yep. uh, the occupying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jack Gaber says, thank you, Ivan. Excellent, interesting presentation. And Sude says, such a brilliant talk. Well-deserved family pride. Really informative for me. Huge thanks, Ivan. Um, well, that's that's a lovely thing to say. Yeah. Thank Sude, you. very yeah. true. Thank you, um, Sue. To be, per to be perfectly honest as well, um, it was quite a... It, uh, not for, I don't know why, but it was. It, it's not the easiest um, pre uh, presentation. It's only the second time I've ever um, given this particular talk. Many of the talks you've seen, I've done over and over again. Um, but um, perhaps it is because it's family. I don't know, but it's not. It's never the easiest one um, to deliver. My mind goes off at tangents because it's family, and uh, I come from. Um, a fishing family on both sides and that uh i sometimes uh start thinking about yeah well there but for the grace of god go i and stuff like that so it's that it's on a much more personal level i think uh, although i didn't intend it to be basic um just fundamentally his life story i wanted him to be the the vessel if you like <laughs> yeah uh, on which to write the story of all the other men and the vessels that went down to um, um, the Adriatic. But, and of course, for every single man, Jack, that went, especially those that got caught up in the same incident, so his story in some respects is their story as well. Yeah, I, I think that's very, you know, very apt in in that you're right, it is one man. And I, 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 can, I can wholly understand why it's, why, not 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 difficult, but why it would be very important to to represent that man well 
Um, mm. Not just because he's he is, he, you know, he was a living, breathing man, um, and in in recent history. But as you say, um, he's he's a, a relation um, to you by marriage, and and makes it all the more important to to represent him well or as well as he deserved. Um, but but um, but but like you say, he, he's in in this story. It's his story that represents a much grander story, and yeah. and and I feel I feel the same way, Ivan. Like, like yourself, really, um, it, it's it's a fortune of time that that we are separated by the toils of war um, by mm. a few generations and no more. Really, you know, you, both both of us being it's it not difficult to imagine ourselves having to be in that situation. Um, and, and wondering what what might become of us in those in those circumstances, and yet in the same way, it's beyond my imagination to have to to have to do such a thing. Uh, luckily, like very luckily, and like I say, it's just, it, that's that's pure coincidence of of you know chronology, really. Mm. Um, well, thank you so much, Ivan. I, I, I won't tie you up too much uh, other than I just wanted to say to everybody, if you've enjoyed tonight's talk, and this is episode number 15, and it was entitled um, Lowest Off Drifters in the Adriatic. If you've enjoyed it, which I'm sure you have because your comments have come in thick and fast to say so, why not click share? Um, we really value you uh, watching and we really value your comments because that know, that helps us to know that you're engaged with it and uh, to let us know what you think. But why not go that extra step and let some other people that you might have on your Facebook feed or, or on your YouTube um, channels and whatnot, why not let them enjoy it as well? If, you, if you've enjoyed it, please click share so that others, others may enjoy it as well. You can, you can watch any of these episodes and this is number 15 you can go back and watch them at any time you like there's there's a wealth now that, that ivan has managed to put together in these in these monday night sessions please remember that next monday there will be no session because we are going fortnightly from now on so the next episode which is number 16 that will occur on monday the 14th of september at 7 30 p.m and that will be entitled why build a harbour at Lowestoft? And uh, we, we mentioned it earlier. We won't go into it again in detail, but um, it, the politics of it is is what I think will fascinate me most, Ivan. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. In the meantime, if you need a little bit of a fix, then why not join Stephen and myself tomorrow night? We'll be live streaming right here on Facebook and YouTube with our regular shanty sessions. That's tomorrow night, Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. We'd love to see you there. We'll be singing some shanties, giving you a little bit of the historical context. And uh, I like to remind everybody every single time that there are books available to buy. Um, they are authored or co-authored or forwarded by Mr. Ivan Bunn. And if you're wondering what they might look like, so you can find them in either Waterstones or perhaps you can order them in your local bookshop, they look rather like this. There's A Trial of Witches, which is by Gilbert Geis and Ivan Bunn. There's George Borrow, Alton and Beyond by Mr. Ivan Bunn. There's a, haunt, a Return to Haunted Lower Stuff. Now that's by Ivan Bunn and Henry Baker. And I believe finally you can also purchase the wonderful uh, book called The Trial of the Lowestoft Witches, a facsimile of the original report of the trial of Amy Denny and Rose Cullender, 1662. This is uh, edited by Henry Baker with a foreword by our very own wonderful Ivan Bunn. They're available, as I said, from Waterstones, or why not try ordering them at your local independent bookshop? And uh, that, the, particularly the Lowest of Witches book. Now, I believe I've even spoken about, about these slightly in the past in one of these history sessions. And um, Halloween's not far away. And if you fancy a bit of a kooky pr uh, present for a loved one, um, then why not get them a Halloween gift, uh, either Haunted Lowestoft, A Trial of Witches, or The Witches Trial Report. Um, all would be fantastic presence in that regard can, uh, I, can, I, can I just come in there please also, do yeah um, the if you want something sort of Halloweeny the best thing the best one of those to buy would be the um the haunted Lowestoft one because uh the trial of witches the big um um one that I co-authored with uh, uh Professor Geis 
Uh, that's a very in-depth study of the last of witch trial. What I did in the haunted Lowestoft one, which you can get in Waterstones at Lowestoft, um, <clears throat> uh, what I did there was I took the nitty gritty from that big tomb, uh, the in-depth study of the trial of the Lowestoft witches. Um, I collected a tremendous amount of local information about the people involved. Uh, when it was published, it was pub pub published uh, um, internationally, that one. Uh, the publishers didn't want too much Lowestoft information in it. So some of it uh, never went in. So I've told the story again um, as a supplement in Haunted Lowestoft, the latest edition, the fourth edition. Uh, but 50% of that is a pricey down um, story of the trial but with some of the local, um, well, just about all of the local information that didn't go into the, the original tomb that I wrote with Professor Geis. Uh, so you get um, the first um, third is the ghost stories of Lowestoft. The last two thirds, um, called Where Witches Once Walked, is the, um, the details of the trial of the Lowestoft witches complete with as much local information as I can find, but stripped of all the um, um, whys and wherefores, why did it happen, how did it happen, or anything like that. It's basically just the story of the trial using the evidence that was given um, in the trial report, um, which is the facsimile one. But if you just bought that one, um, book you get for halloween you get your ghost stories and you get the the, the witches and the bargain and Thank i think you. they're still doing it waterstones it, uh, if you buy that copy that particular volume and also the facsimile um if you buy them both together i think uh, waterstones um do them for about three pound the two three pounds cheaper than if you bought them separately um yeah. i'm sure they still do um uh, but that's just a thought yeah that's a good thought and i'll tell you what i'm going to recommend that to mr lee chapman i've been working uh with lee today uh, alongside his band the austin beats and um, what a fantastic band they are now uh, lee mentioned um that he'd been watching these these sessions um he's a, a f like myself and stephen he's a dean's alumni um so he remembers yeah. you well ivan and yeah, I remember um, lee. how could you forget lee yeah, well, I don't need to because I saw him today and he was in fine form with his band, a really fantastic mm -hmm. band, the Austin Beats. Um, but he was mentioning uh, how much he'd enjoyed it and th that he loves history, obviously. Um, and he was he was uh, mentioning to me that his grandparents used to live in one of the oldest houses in uh, up in North Lowestoft. And um, and we, we kind of converged to, um, that it may be that, that one that has... Um, Bear with me. What is it? Ah, uh, yes. Um, our good friend of the shanties, the rogue shanty chorus, uh, Mr. Kevin, um, he mentioned that there was a house up in the top of the old high street that used to be two houses and a ghost passes from one house to the next house. And apparently it's, that's the very house that Lee Chapman's grandparents or grandfather grew up in. And uh, he's, he's got he's or he had tales of, of, I think he had pneumonia at the time, and uh, a, a small young girl used to visit him in his sickbed. Um, but, of course, he, he was rather feverish. Anyway, Lee, if you're watching, which I'm sure you are, um, Haunted Lowestoft is, is the one is the one to get yourself or maybe if you've got any admirers um they could or fans of the austin beats they could splash out and uh, and buy a couple of books to get that discount off hopefully that waterstones will still apply anyway ivan uh, i've rattled on once again i'm just going to say thank you very much to our funders people's health trust for making these lowest off history sessions possible uh, we're very grateful for to them for the support that they offer these history sessions as well as our tuesday night regular shanty sessions and I'm going to say uh, one last time, in two weeks' time, the next episode will be number 16, Why Build a Harbour at Lowestoft? Of course, it will feature our wonderful historian, Mr. Ivan Bunn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ivan, and good night. Bye. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night.